chapter 5, we're going to be looking at just a couple of verses that illustrate well a point that's made frequently throughout the book of Acts, but in a most concise way, uh, Acts chapter 5 kind of represents that for us. So if you want to follow along your Bibles, I'd encourage you to do that. You can look at the greater context there. Or if you just want to use your bulletin, the verses are printed on the inside of the bulletin. There's some room to make some notes there. This event took place in January of 1999, but it was brought to my uh, recollection not too long ago because, as I understand it, they just finished making a movie about this, and this movie is supposed to be released in uh, the first month or two of next year. Uh, I really look forward to this. Let me tell you a synopsis of what this is about. It's about a family. Uh, his name's Graham. Her name was Gladys. Uh, they had three children. The oldest child was Esther. And then they had a boy named Philip and Timothy. At the time of the story, Philip was 10 and Timothy was 6. They were from Australia, but they were missionaries to India. They were in India trying to uh, work with translating the scriptures, telling people about Jesus, but they had a focus working with people who had leprosy. While there, Graham and his two boys, Philip and Timothy, got in the station wagon and went on one of their trips to a remote village. And it was far enough away from where they lived at the time that it would be, uh, and they had enough to do while they were there, it would be difficult for them to come back on the same day. So Graham thought it best just to spend the night in their station wagon. It would be about the safest place for them to be. So Graham and Philip and Timothy are sleeping, and in the middle of the night some some Hindu extremists come out and barricade the car, douse it with gasoline, and literally burned them alive. Burned them alive. It was was something, I mean, these kind of things take place in different parts of the world. We usually don't hear about them until some foreigners are involved. But this made waves. But what really made waves is the way that Gladys responded. She wrote a letter that was published in the largest circulating paper in India that showed no animosity, no sign of vengeance. It was, in essence, a prayer for the people of India. And the part of the story that just got to me was the funeral service. Because at the funeral service, I don't know if you can picture this or not, here she is. This is her husband and her two little boys. And the graveside, she and her daughter sang a song. And the words to this song she sang was, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know who holds the future, my life is worth the living just because he lives. You know, powerful words, but, but sung by a mother and daughter at a time of loss like that, communicated something that literally shook India. And I think if I stopped right, right there, you'd get it. But would you, would you process with this with me for just a minute? So many times, the message of Christianity, I hate to say it this way, but it's true. If you really hear the real Christian message, it sounds too good to be true. Especially when you compare it with all other world religions. Because other, all other world religions, there's something you have to do. Something you have to understand. Something that has to be achieved. And you mean to tell me that God sends his own son to take care of everything? It doesn't depend on me at all. It's all him, not me. It just sounds too good to be true. But when you run across followers of Christ who are able to stand in situations like that, you know, let me put it this way. It's a living testimony that shows that the message that seems too good to be true must be true. Do you understand what I'm saying? How in the world can people respond that way unless to their core they know it's true? It's hard for me at one level to say this because because I I, I don't mean to slight or ignore all the rational and logical arguments there are for God. There are many. Oh, I love sinking my teeth into some of these things. Because the more you get into it, the more you find, wow, you just can't get around the existence of God. But you know what? Just for this morning, you put the logical aside. Sometimes people need more than just logic. They need to see it lived out. Maybe, just maybe, mm, let's go a little bit further than that. 
more than just maybe one of the reasons God allows life to be so tough. It's because this world needs living proof. We've been talking about the church persecuted. You can't, you can't go through the book of Acts. You can't go through the New Testament without seeing that being a follower of Christ will cost you. Always has, always will. It'll cost you. But here's, here's something we've, we've been finding as we go through these passages. God uses the persecution to get his people go. Get out there where they need to be in the first place. God uses persecution to help his church grow. And this morning, I just want us to focus a little bit of time on the fact that God uses persecution, difficulties, the tragedies of life to help us know. God uses persecution to help us. What, what do I mean by that? You'll find out something about yourself at a deeper level than you ever knew before when you go through this stuff. And the world will find out something too. Will you just take those two steps with me? What do we know about ourselves and what's the world going to know if we face persecution? Uh, persecution. What, what, can I define this? I'm not just talking about the junk in life. I'm not just talking about the hardships. Hardships because you're a follower of Jesus. Right? What, how, how does it help you know? And how does it help the world know? First of all, how, how does it... Very, very important point. But think with this, this with me. I'm going to try to present it a couple different ways because I probably don't look at some of these things the way other people do. But let, let me try. One of the things that people somewhere along the line grapple with, you know, one of these things that you think about as a follower of Christ, you, you question yourself and you say, am I really following Jesus? Am I really following God because he's God? Or am I following God because the kind of life I get for following God? You know what I mean? Because I don't want to go to hell. I do want to go to heaven, right? I, I want the joy and peace of passes. I want all that stuff. Well, am I following God because I know following God, even, even through the hardships, I know it gives me this? Is that the reason I'm following God? Or am I just following God because he's God? Can, can I just suggest, I, I know this isn't a lot of fun, but can I just suggest there's probably no better way of parsing that out than getting rid of the good stuff. Am I following God to get the good stuff or am I just following God to get because he's God? Well, one of the ways you can find out is by getting rid of the good stuff. Let, let, let me back up and try this again. Uh, I, I, I don't know if you've heard this before. I've heard this several times. I've heard people say, you know what? I tried that Christian thing. I, I tried church. I tried all that stuff. It just didn't work for me. If you've ever heard anybody say that, I'll tell you my first thought. Here's my first thought. As soon as you say, I tried and it didn't work, my thought is, you didn't really try. And I know that sounds so judgmental. Let me, let me defend myself a little bit further. <laughs> the reason why I say you didn't really try, because if you say you tried and it didn't work out, then it tells me you didn't really try the way it was meant to be tried because the way it's meant to be tried, there's no working out. Whether it works out or not, God is God. Does that make sense? Whatever's most important to you is your God. First commandment says you should have no other gods before me. God needs to be most important to you. If you're following God because blank, then you're not really letting God be God. The blank has turned into God. Let me give you a biblical illustration of this. It's found in Genesis chapter 22. The verse is verse 12. Very familiar story. If you read through Genesis any time recently, there's this guy named Abraham. Can't miss him. <laughs> but Abraham has what many people would say his greatest challenge because the child he's been waiting for his whole life. God says, I want you to offer that child to me. In the 22nd chapter of Genesis, Abraham's got knife in hand. Book of Hebrews tells us it, Isaac was as good as dead. He wasn't pulling one of these, I'm really going to do it. No, he was really going to do it. But in verse 12, God stops him. Do you remember this story? He's going to offer his only son and God stops him. And what does God say in verse 12? God says to Abraham, he says, Abraham, now I know. Now I know 
You know what? Now Abraham knows too. Now everybody knows. He knows what? I'm not following God because he gave me the promise, child. I'm not following God because everything worked. No, I'm following God because he's God. And even when God tells me something that I, this doesn't make any sense to me at all. God, this is not the way it's supposed to be. God, this isn't like you. But if it's God, it's God. And that's the end of the story. Do you understand what I'm saying? Nothing shows you that. Nothing in life shows you that. Like the really hard things in life. Well, let's get on. It's not just something that helps us know. It's help, something that helps the world know. Something that helps the world know. Can I say this? Unlike anything else we can do? Ajay Law, missionary to central India, talked about him a few weeks ago, told us about one of the young men in his church in India. He was a new convert. He'd only been a Christian for about a year when this happened. He was raised in an Islamic area of, usually you think Hinduism, but this was Islamic. He was, he was raised in an Islamic area of India, been Islamic all his life, but he was converted to Christianity. About a year after his conversion, some of his closest companions, people he would have called his closest friends when he was Islamic, kidnapped him. They kidnapped him. They beat him up. He's laying on the ground, all beaten up. They made their intentions known. They were going to kill him. And he knew, this is probably the last few minutes of my life. So if you, if you can picture this, guy's beat up by people who've known him all his life. And one of the guys has his, his foot right on his chest. And he said the interesting thing was, you know, uh, it's, it's not one of these honor things, you know, we're, we're doing this for our faith and stuff like that. We're killing this person. No, he said it was much more personal. And, and he said what, what he meant by that was, was it was so, they were so angered. It's like they took this personally. They were so mad at this guy. They were screaming and yelling at him. They, they told him that they intended to kill him, but they wanted to ask him for something first. It bothered them so much. These guys with their foot on his chest, they're screaming at him and they say, why? Who, why did you leave us? Why, why did you choose Christianity over Islam? Why the Bible over the cry? Why, why this Jesus instead of Muhammad? Why? They really wanted to know. And so here, here he is with his foot on his chest, praying the whole time, but thinking this may be the last thing he ever says. And in boldness, here's what he says. He says to, the, to, to these guys who knew him, he said, let, let me ask you something before I answer you. Let me, let me ask you, have you seen any difference in my life? You've known me my whole life. Have you seen any difference? And that agitated these guys who were attacking him. They really got worked up and they said, yes, that's why we're so mad. It's like darkness to light. You're, you're, you're like a person we never even knew. You're so good, it makes us mad. And his response is, well, then that's my answer. That's why Christianity over Islam, that's why the Bible over the crown, that's why Jesus over Muhammad. And he says these guys who intended to kill him were so shaken, they left the room. That's why he lived to tell the story. Listen, I hope... And I seriously doubt that anybody's ever going to put a foot on your chest. But they are going to put eyes on your life. And they're going to put eyes on your life, especially when life gets really, really hard. And they want to know, is there a difference? And you know what? Your life can speak. And show that it really is true. I, I know I've told you before, but it just, I, I, forgive me for telling you again, it just illustrates, I think, the point so well. Homeschool Legal Defense magazine that they put out several years ago had an article about a man, and if memory serves me, it was happened in Pennsylvania. I could have some of these details wrong. And I also believe he was an Amish man. Those parts I'm not sure about, but the rest of the story I am sure he was taken to court. He was taken to court because he didn't send his son to public school. The rules for homeschooling are different in different parts of the country. And evidently, where he lived, he didn't meet the requirements. Some places you have to have you know, a bachelor's degree or you have to have certification or something like that before they allow you to homeschool. He did not meet the requirements. He had been warned several times. He was finally arrested. He was brought into court. And they were, this, this was a synopsis of what took place. As he's there in the courtroom, the judge 
tries to explain it to him one more time. He says, Mr. So-and-so, I'm, I'm, un I'm under the impression this has already been explained to you, but let me just go ahead and verify this. You do know that you're breaking the law. The laws for sending your children to school are such and such. You don't meet these requirements. You're violating the law. And he says, I understand that. The judge says, all right, you're going to be punished if you don't send your child to school. And the judge gave him a certain amount of time. I think it was a week. He said, I just want you to know, if by next week you haven't sent your son to public school, you will be arrested and you will serve time. And the Amish man responded by saying, Judge, I don't need a week. I'm going to give you the same answer next week I'm giving you right now. I am not sending my son to school. And so the judge was agitated and said, all right. And he ordered him to be taken down to a holding cell. He says, you're going to jail. You're going to jail right now. They took him. They locked him up. And a few minutes passed, just a few minutes. And the judge ordered that he be taken from the cell and brought back to the courtroom. And when he was brought back to the courtroom, the judge announced to everybody, all charges dismissed. He can take his son and go home. And everybody else is shocked. And the judge says, let me explain it to you. He says, the law does require that you send your child to school. And here are the standards, and he doesn't meet those standards. But the only exception the law makes is not for any preference, including religious preference. It only makes an exception for religious conviction. And this man just proved to me it wasn't a preference. It was a conviction. That is what the world's waiting to see. It's not a belief that comes and goes. It's not a belief that we have when it works. Even when it's... Even when it's that which we never thought would happen. We know we can face tomorrow. Jesus said that when we meet together, as often as you meet, he wants us to take some bread and some juice. I, I say this so often. We think about it so often. Unfortunately, sometimes, I'm sorry, it just takes it away. It takes away from what it really is. This bread and this juice is to remember the most horrific death that has ever been experienced. He asks us to regular, regularly remember the most horrific death that anybody ever experienced. And why was Jesus willing to experience that death? Because he knew it really was possible to get you and me right with our Father in heaven through his suffering. He proved it's true. That's why he was willing to suffer. We're going to pause in just a minute and I want you to think about what he suffered because it really is possible to have that relationship with God. But I also want you to think about what you're willing to suffer. Because it's true. One last story. I can't even remember the guy's name. My, my dad and my brother knew him much better than I. But he, but he preached forever. I don't even know if the guy's still alive. This happened several years ago in Ohio. Another graveside service. At the grave, there was an interesting sight. He was burying his wife of probably married to her for 45, 50 years. And he had tears coming down his cheeks, but he had the biggest smile on his face at the exact same time. And he sang several hymns, like, because he lives, I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone. Because I know who holds the future. Life is worth the living just because he lives. And somebody asked him, at the graveside service. How can you do that? And his answer was, 
These aren't fairy tales. It's true. And our lives prove it, right? When you're ready, come to the table.